So hello everyone and welcome to tonight's program. My name is Shireen Ash. I'm a librarian at the Corte Madero Library. And I'm really thrilled to have two authors tonight to talk about their book, These Fists Break Bricks. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> um, so both our authors are here tonight and we'll just jump in in a moment, but I'm gonna ask everyone to stay um, muted throughout, but please pop your questions into the chat and um, Grady or Chris will dive into answer them. Um, we're also recording this, as I said, and um, it should be popped up and ready to go on our website and YouTube channel within two weeks, often quicker. So our book tonight is These Fists Break Bricks. Here it is. Can you see it through my waves? No, you can't. I won't try that anymore. Um, so um, the authors tonight are Chris um, Pajoli and Grady Hendricks. So a little bit about them. Chris is a librarian, a film historian, and a writer. He's written for magazines, websites, and edited the film, the fanzine Temple of Schlock. Grady is a New York Times bestselling novelist. He's the co-founder of the New York Asian Film Festival. He's worked in both the American and Asian film industries, and he's also a screenwriter of such films as Mohawk and Satanic Panic. So we are going to jump right in um, with our interview. And as I said, if you have questions, please don't be shy and put them in the chat. So Chris, we're going to start with you. Can you talk about the origins of this project and how you went from being just a public librarian to being a published <laughs> author as well? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, I, uh, I always enjoyed uh, the martial arts movies uh, from when I was a teenager and uh, collected magazines and you know wh whenever I would do research for other projects either my own writing or if I was uh, being hired to write liner notes for a DVD or a Blu-ray or something like that I, I would do my own research on the side uh, and and uh, just accumulated a lot of uh, a lot of information about the martial arts movies in the U.S., uh, their releases, and and also uh, as a collector of movie posters, uh, accumulated uh, over 400 movie posters that were just uh, martial arts movies. And uh, at a certain point, I was thinking about uh, putting all of this, all the posters and the research that I had done together to do a, some kind of a book uh, about about the releases of these movies, and I knew Grady. We had uh, collaborated on a couple of uh, uh, audio commentaries for uh, you know Blu-rays. Uh, one one in particular, which was uh, like a collection of movie trailers, it was like two or three hours of movie trailers, and, and we did an audio commentary for for that. And and I just I knew Grady from uh, screenings around the city you know, and, and in Philadelphia. So, uh, so I, I asked him if this was a good idea. I had pitched it to a couple of other publishers and they weren't too, uh, weren't too interested in it. And I think they, they just couldn't see beyond just a collection of posters. And uh, in talking with Grady, we very quickly came to the conclusion that there was a story to be told here with this. And, you know, if, if we could, uh, pull together the posters and the ads and the other images that I had, and then all the research and to, uh, you know, tell like a combination of a coffee table book and a history book uh, to tell the story uh, that that would be the best way to do it. And it worked. Yep. Nice. <laughs> So, um, Grady, you're a best-selling author. Um, you're well known for horror novels, um, but you also have a background in cinema, as we mentioned, and lived in Hong Kong. So, can you tell us how you know your journey to writing this book from um, all of those bits and pieces? Yeah, I mean, you know, I uh, I went to NYU, and my wife and I uh, were broke because when you go to college, you're broke. And um, the Music Palace, which wound up being the last um, Chinese movie theater in North America was down the street from us. And it was a double feature for six bucks. And we didn't know the movies, but we're like, yeah, why not? And um, I think the first thing we saw there was um, 
Tricky Brains, a Stephen Chow movie, and then Always Be the Winner, which is a wild sort of comedy with Tony, little Tony Lung in it and some other people. And we were like, well, where have these movies been all our lives? So we used to go there all the time. And then when we were graduating, you know, oh, what are we going to do? And I bumped into a friend of ours who was Chinese American. His family was from Hong Kong. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm moving to Hong Kong. You know, it's easy to get a job there. And we're like, oh, great. So I came home. I was like, I just bumped into Alex. You know, he's moving back to Hong Kong. We should all go. And I lost his phone number. So my wife and I moved to Hong Kong. He never did, I don't think. Uh, I think he just went back to California, like San Jose or somewhere. Um, and we lived there for a little bit. And <clears throat> really fell in love with it and came back to the States. And, you know, I, I, there was early days of the internet. You were sort of trading information, cobbling together what you could find. And um, I wound up uh, when the music palace closed, um, several people who went there sort of got in touch and were like, you know, people are going to keep showing Zhang Yimou movies. They're going to show Wong Kar Wai movies. They're going to show art films, but like the stupid comedies and the romances and the action movies we all love. No one was going to be showing those once this theater was gone. So we all sort of threw in a thousand bucks each. We'd never done any film work before. There were about six of us. And we started showing these movies. We found who distributed them and started bringing them to New York and kind of learned by doing. And uh, it turned into a big festival that's, I think, in its 20th year now. Um, that's over. We've moved it over to Lincoln Center. And I don't do anything with it anymore. It's too much work. I, don't, I hate work. Um, <clears throat> and so then when Chris was talking about doing this book, I'd done paperbacks from hell which is a um, history of the horror paperback boom of the 70s and 80s. And this was something that was in the same vein. And the hardest thing was figuring out what the story is. Like what, and, and there is one, you know, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a bigger story than we thought it was. And the research really um, ate us alive, um, especially the first chapter of the book, which is kind of the early days before everything sort of kicked off in 1973, when this movie Five Fingers of Death came to the U.S. And, kicked off the Kung Fu craze. And that was right around the time Bruce Lee broke in the US. But we wanted to make sure we had what was before there because nothing just starts out of nowhere. And that wound up being sort of the hardest, but I think kind of the most rewarding part of doing the book. <clears throat> well, well, speaking of that, you, you ground the book in the history of martial arts uh, and development in the United States. Can you talk about that? And why you know it's why you chose to put it in, in the book and 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 how it makes sense in the trajectory of your whole story well uh as grady said people when when writing about these movies it's always oh uh kung fu came on the air in 1972 and it was a big hit and then it led to five fingers of death and and then the craze it was kicked off at that point but it, it didn't just start with Kung Fu and, you know, the, so we, we really wanted to go back, you know, decade by decade really, and, and try to find like the earliest. Um, and, and it started with the movies, like trying to find, and you know, television and movie appearances of, of different martial arts. And in doing that, we, we really kind of got to the, you know, the turn of the century when judo, and, and jujitsu uh, came to the U.S., and those were the first. And then it led to karate, and then you had taekwondo, and so we really had to like tear it down and then build it back up, uh, and and tell the history of martial arts in the U.S. in order to tell the history of martial arts movies in the U.S. and on television. And and that that was uh, it was fascinating to to uh, to keep finding earlier and earlier appearances, and and now like I'll, I'll watch uh, old western shows from the fifties where you have stuntmen who are doing judo and it's like completely anachronistic having you know Native Americans fighting cavalry men using judo and. <laughs> you know that it's it's 1953 and these stuntmen probably had military backgrounds they learned these martial arts they're trying this out it looks great on camera but you know we we know the history like what when when these martial arts came to the u.s and you know it's it's totally 1950s you know martial arts on camera as opposed to you know 18 whatever and, and you know, it just wasn't happening like that 
uh, that they're doing these uh, Japanese, you know, uh, judo throws. Uh, so yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it was really interesting, uh, you know, get, getting to the heart of it. Yeah. And also, you know, one of the things that was really amazing to us is, you know, martial arts existed in America before, I mean, Kung Fu, the TV show, I think Bruce Lee was a big thing for a lot of people, but Kung Fu, the TV show, like Chris is saying, really was what kind of popularized it. Network TV with David Carradine. Um, and I don't know in case anyone's unfamiliar with David Carradine, he's a white guy. And, you know, martial arts, that they, they came over with largely Japanese immigrants coming here at the turn of the century and engaging in these judo bouts for money, like, you know, to really make ends meet. And, you know, you had these guys who were five foot five, five foot six, who were these amazing judo masters who were taking on these six foot, 200 pound plus wrestlers and kicking their butts all up and down the West Coast. And it was this real white panic of, you know, oh my God, white manhood, these Asians are, you know, d- you know undermining our, our, our strength and superiority. Um, and, and they were amazing guys coming over and doing this. I mean, they were couch surfing and doing fruit picking and, and itinerant labor and all these and some is starting nurseries, but they were also, you know, these exquisite martial artists. Um, we don't really talk about boxing um, because I mean, we're talking about, you know, uh, Asian martial arts, mostly in the book, but, you know, a lot of the early foundational boxers were, were black Americans. Um, you know, they would, in many cases, they were enslaved workers who won their freedom boxing. I mean, boxing, you used to not block. You used to just take it on your face. Um, and it was a, a black man who, who invented the concept of, Hey, I can block this and not get punched in the face every five seconds. Um, and, and so you had to really, and, and, you know, martial arts, especially judo, uh, and later karate, but especially judo was always very, um, had strong roots in the black community, um, to a large extent, because in, um, all the, the nation of Islam really advocated, you know, being strong, being self-sufficient, uh, being disciplined and the fruit of Islam, which was the security arm for the nation, uh, did not carry weapons because, um, for, for a lot of religious and practical reasons and, but they studied judo. Uh, and later karate. And so all the way back to the, the 40s and 50s, you're seeing these articles about, you know, the fruit of Islam training in, in martial arts. So we felt like, you know, you're not, and, and you can't really talk about the martial arts story without talking about the Japanese internment camps, um, because that's really where judo took a body blow. It had a hard time recovering from. It was everywhere, like Chris was saying. I mean, it was a huge craze. There were dojos everywhere in America, and then, you know, the United States issued executive order. And I can't remember the name off the top of my head. And all our Japanese citizens were put in concentration camps. And all those dojos closed or went on ice. And, and you know, there was a huge gap there um, that was really, really tragic for the sport, uh, you know, and, and tragic for the people who were, were put in camps. So, you know, the story of martial arts in America is so tied up with American history um, that it, we could have done a whole separate book just about about all of that, you know? And like Chris is saying, you had these stuntmen doing TV work who were, I mean, some of them were just amazing. I mean, there's, I just want to look up because, uh, so <clears throat> there was a guy uh, named Kim, Kim Kahana, who was a Hawaiian Japanese martial artist um, who did a lot of stunt work on the Banana Splits Adventure Hour in the 60s and things like that. But I mean, Kim Kahana was a third grade dropout who became a paratrooper in the Korean War, who was executed by a North Korean firing squad who killed a lot of people at the same time. He managed to survive the execution, dug himself out of a mass grave. He then went back into combat, was completely blind after a hand grenade went off in his face. He eventually recovered his eyesight he survived a plane crash when he returned to the United States that killed 35 other passengers and he walked away. And at that point, he just went to LA and became a stuntman. Um, you know, and he wound up being Charles Bronson's regular stuntman. But like, I'd never heard of Kim Kahana before, but this is this incredible guy who was doing stunts on a children's Saturday morning show. Um, you know, so there were mm-hmm. so many rabbit holes like that. There were just 
it was hard for us to limit what was in the book because we just kept coming up with so much great stuff. And uh, there's a book, uh, there's a biography of Kahana. <clears throat> oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I, I bought a copy for the library and it was so interesting. I bought my own copy. <laughs> <laughs> and Kennedy's the author. Kahana, The Untold Stories. Oh, wow. Yeah. He, he sounds like perfect fodder for an adventure movie. I mean, just mm -hmm. kind of remarkable survival story. <laughs> and he's one of dozens that we stumbled across, you know? I mean... It, it, it's a really, there's so much more here. And that's one of the things we really uh, hope that like people use our book as kind of a starting point because there's so many other stories out there that, that need to be explored and, and, and told. Seems like you could, you guys could be busy writing many more books in the future. Um, <laughs> but, but I want to jump ahead just um, mm -hmm. since you talked about the um, films uh, both of you and Chris, you were talking about um, seeing the um, was it judo moves or karate moves mm -hmm. that Native Americans were doing in the early um, Westerns and 50s. I'm really interested if you could talk a little bit about the influence of um, Kung Fu films on American films. Like, and can we see that in evidence today in movies and how they're edited or shot or um, how the action is portrayed, the fight scenes in particular? Sure. Well, the, the easiest uh through line to follow is Yun Wu Ping, who was a big choreographer on uh, Hong Kong films and then started directing movies. He di directed uh, the two uh, Jackie Chan's first uh, big hits, Drunken Master and uh, Snake and the Eagle's Shadow, and uh, directed movies through the 80s and then became a big choreographer on uh, uh, you know, Hollywood films like Kill Bill and The Matrix. And, nice. and uh, you know, he worked on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you know, uh, numerous movies. So you're right there. I mean, he, he's he's the easiest person to point to. Uh, and, and, you know, the I think probably the biggest influence. But it's it's just uh, it's so ingrained in films now. Uh, any any action movie or you know, or, or let's let's just take a look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, those movies, I mean, they're they're, they're based on comic books, but the comic books like Iron Fist, uh, Iron Fist came about because it was uh, uh, it was a, a comic based on uh, martial arts, which were, you know, the martial arts movies in the early to mid 70s were so popular that these uh, comic book writers uh, started you know, were influenced by the the moves that they saw and uh, and the stories that were being told in these movies. So, you know, now now you have uh, an Iron Fist TV series, or you know, maybe they'll work Iron Fist into uh, some of the movies or Daredevil. Uh, you know, we've had Daredevil movies now. I mean, there, there were mar martial arts all through Frank Miller's Daredevil comics, and you know that works its way into the movies as well, and. You know, even something like Nobody, uh, th that movie from uh, two years ago, uh, where you have just this, uh, you, you think he's an average guy, but he turns out to be a, an agent uh, of some sort, you know, and, and you know, he's, he has martial arts training. Uh, it, it, everybody in an action movie nowadays has some martial arts training, it seems. And there's also, you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting is, these movies, and it's sort of something we talk about a lot in the book, there's a lot of mixing and remixing in this, a lot of taking things from different cultures and, and importing them and exporting them and reinterpreting them and, and remixing them. And, and that's how martial arts works. I mean, you know, judo is a couple of different Japanese martial arts systems that were kind of like mushed together by a guy in the 19th century, or probably earlier than that a little bit. You know, it, it's so, and it happens over and over. Um, you know, in Hong Kong, when they were making martial arts movies in the 60s and some of the early ones, um, they were importing cinematographers from Japan. So they were, and they were bringing in and studying films from Japan and, and you know, and then Korean action filmmakers were looking at movies from Hong Kong and Japan and getting influenced that way. Um, one of the huge influences um, on Hong Kong stunts um, was a Robert Wise movie called The Sand Pebbles with uh, Steve McQueen because it's shot in Hong Kong and all of a sudden they were hiring everyone. 
And all of a sudden, all these Hong Kong stuntmen were taking Hollywood techniques and finding ways to reinterpret them in a more Hong Kong manner. And then those techniques were then, as Chris was saying, coming back to the U.S. So it's it's all, you know, people influencing each other in sort of this like virtuous cycle. Um, and one of the things I, this is sort of my pet bugbear, but I also feel like one of the places you really see the influence of martial arts movies is uh, the training montage. Like that sort of, you saw it a lot in the early, in Rocky and then the Rocky films, but that fetishization of training, um, that's something you get right from martial arts movies. And I really feel like there's a line you can draw because in the early seventies, there was this huge trend in Hong Kong of showing authentic martial arts techniques in movies and showing the training to make sure the audience knew it was authentic. And so those movies were coming to Chinatown, they were being seen in the US. And I really feel like that was an influence, sort of a ghost influence on uh, Hollywood training stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And by the way, someone, uh, Stephanie, I think asked, when did women start in martial arts movies? And I just want to say back to the beginning, um, Chin Siang was the first giant movie star in China in the 1930s. And she was this teenage girl who basically did her own stunt. She would just jump out of windows. She would ride horses. She would do swords play. She would do martial arts. And she became a huge, huge movie star in China and then later moved to Hong Kong and actually helped start a movie company that did a lot of the martial arts films there in the early, in the late 40s. Um, and um, she was still doing stunts and martial arts up through the 70s. Um, and actually, I think her last acting credit is in the 1990s. Um, but she's also very famous because her son, her grandson is Sam Oh Hung, who was a uh, a classmate uh, as a child with Jackie Chan at the Chinese opera school he went to. And, and Sammo wound up becoming a hugely influential and famous uh, martial arts film director. Uh, but so yeah, all the way back to the 1930s. And you talk about that in your book. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a nice section actually. So there are a few more questions. Mm -hmm. um, should we address those? Um, sure, sure. Well, we meaning you guys. Yep. Well, I see Frank. Uh, Frank's chiming in about yeah. Stephen Chow. Uh, oh yeah. Stephen Chow movies. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, those are definitely legitimate. So yeah, Shaolin mm -hmm. soccer and yeah. Yeah. I mean, he works with real old school martial arts mm -hmm. choreographers. I think he worked with Yun Wu Ping for Forbidden City Cop. I mean, he works with the real deals. Mm -hmm. And he and he's a huge, like you said, Frank. He's a huge Bruce Lee fan. Well, so now that we're venturing into talking about actors so much um let's talk about two of the genre's biggest stars that um, um have been lost recently sunny chiba i believe that's how you pronounce his name and mm -hmm. jimmy wang yu can you talk about these two actors their contributions and kind of what made them so important chris sure. you want to talk chiba Okay. <laughs> you, you're, you know Chiba better than I do. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so, Sonny Chiba um, was, uh, he started out as he wanted to be a, a track star. He wanted to be like an, an Olympic track star and he injured himself. So he got into acting. He answered a, a, an open casting call, I think, or they were doing a talent search at Toei Films. And so he, he went there and, and, they, they plugged him right into a TV series uh, that had lost its star. And uh, I think they put him in around episode 20 or 25 of the superhero series. And, and then he did another superhero series and he did um, these like B movies. They, they had a, a series of like one hour films that were like second features. So they made him a leading man in these, uh, in these B film second features and eventually he did a, 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 a movies for the same studio. I mean, he, he spent probably 20, 25 years at Toei, um, exclu well, about 20 years exclusively with them and became a big star on television in the late 60s. Uh, but all the time he was uh, doing martial arts training. And so he has uh, black belts and in, in uh, karate and kendo and uh, kempo and and. Uh, judo i think uh yeah def definitely judo because he he did some judo films in the mid 60s for toei so uh in the early 70s uh a movie he made called the street fighter uh that's what it was released as in the u.s uh became a big hit and 
because the U.S. distributor sold him as like the next Bruce Lee, uh, even though he'd had been around for 15 years and had done all, all different types of genres. I mean, he'd done comedies and, and uh, romance films and, and uh, you know, it wasn't just martial arts, but uh, he became a big star in martial arts cinema in the U.S. in the 70s. He really was the, the, uh, the major representative of karate films when most of the other martial arts movies in the U.S. at the time were Kung Fu or Taekwondo. And, uh, and Jimmy Wang Yu, who uh, was influenced by some of those judo movies, uh, you know, that Chiba and other Japanese actors had done and, uh, and, and became a big star in Hong Kong cinema. And, uh, you know, before, before Bruce Lee was making yeah. movies. Yeah, Jimmy Wong Yu is really where a lot of it starts in Hong Kong. Um, before he made this movie called One Armed Swordsman in 1967, the biggest stars in Hong Kong were mostly women. Um, and, you know, the, the male actors, they could be famous, but they weren't huge the way these female icons were. And um, 67 was a big year in Hong Kong. It was uh, a lot of anti-colonial protests, a lot of anti-colonial riots. Um, it was it was a real um, wild sort of the city basically was was on fire to a large extent for that entire year. And the movie seemed very out of touch. There were a lot of musicals coming out. Uh, martial arts movies were very soft. They were very um, they were about sort of wandering swordsmen who were these educated young men, often played by women in drag. Um, who sort of had these, you know, they were cla they recited classical poetry and they were very, the, the, the action was more like dance than anything. Um, and a director named Chang Che really wanted to, he was just starting out. He really wanted to make I think movies where, where um, they were bloody and violent and sort of reflected the world he saw around him. And he needed a star like James Dean. He wanted someone who had a lot of attitude. He wasn't like a company man. Shaw Brothers was the big studio at the time. And the actors, a lot of them lived on dormitories on the back lot. Uh, the boss, Sir Run Run Shaw, monitored their comings and goings. They wore ties. They talked the company line. And Jimmy Wong Yu was just this pissed off, irritated guy with a lot of attitude. And, um, and, and like Chiba, he sort of came in through these open auditions. Uh, I think he was a swimmer. Um, and... Uh, he um, and Chang Che teamed up for this movie called One Armed Swordsman that became a huge hit. It was violent. It was macho. Um, and that really kicked off the modern wave of Kung Fu movies. Um, and Jimmy Wong Yu had a giant, had a chip on his shoulder that was probably about the size of him all over again. <laughs> um, but he was also enormously smart. And a lot of these early martial arts movies in 67, 68, 70, 71, or 70, they were swordplay movies. They were people with weapons. Um, and he was looking at all these Japanese movies where it was this style versus that style. And he wanted to do that with Chinese Kung Fu, which hadn't really featured in Hong Kong movies in a while. Um, and all the bosses were like, Jimmy, stop. You're, you're an actor, pat him on the head. Go back, go, go back and act some more. And finally, he convinced them he was going to quit. And they let him star in and direct and write this movie called Chinese Boxer about Chinese Kung Fu. And it was a huge hit and kicked off this whole craze that kind of resulted in Bruce Lee coming to the to prominence uh, with these barehanded Kung Fu movies. Um, and in 73, when Bruce Lee broke big in America, two Jimmy Wong Yu movies became relatively big hits here. One was a uh, Chinese boxer, which got retitled as a uh, hammer of God, I think. And the other was a movie he did called the desperate chase, which wasn't quite as big of a hit, but the story with that one was great. It got retitled blood of the dragon in America. And this uh, guy named Michael Thevis out of Atlanta was going to, he was a, uh, a, a music producer and he was going to get the film with this blood of the dragon movie. And, um, and it came out and then it turned out um, within a few weeks of it opening Thevis was arrested and his company was shut down uh, by the FBI because Thevis was actually not a music producer. He was a uh, porn baron um, and he uh, did things like murder his rivals, one of whom he put a car, a pipe bomb in their truck the same weekend that Blood of the Dragon opened 
uh, and had a rival killed. Um, and he wound up going to prison um, and then escaped from prison because he gave a really huge donation to Jimmy Carter's campaign for president. And because of that, got transferred to a minimum security prison that he just walked out of one day. And he sort of rambled around for a couple of months. He was on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. He shotgun murdered a witness in his trial. Um, you know, did he had sort of a to-do list while he was out on the loose <laughs> and was eventually uh, arrested trying to cash a $37,000 check. Um, and when he went back to prison, he was really annoyed that everyone thought he was a chump for getting caught, uh, uh, from escaping and getting caught and being brought back in. So he bragged about all the people he murdered um, to make everyone think he was a tough guy and not just this kind of businessman who was an idiot. And um, everyone was like, wow, tell me more about these people you've murdered. And then they all snitched on him. Mm -hmm. And he wound up getting this massive sentence. I think he died in prison while still serving it. Um, but anyways, but Jimmy Wong Yu went on and, and was hugely successful. He's one of the few actors to ever walk out on a Shaw Brothers contract. He got sued by Shaw Brothers. He was barred from making movies in Hong Kong for years because of that. He just went and made them in Taiwan. Um, and uh, he wound up sort of leaving the movie business and getting into business business, which didn't go great. Um, and then he sort of had a revival in film in the 2000s and just passed away recently. But he was an amazing guy, uh, really, like Chiba, just had a really colorful wildlife. And for a while there, it seemed like his, his business decisions, his creative decisions uh, had a lot to do with how, how much can I annoy Shaw Brothers? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, oh, well, you know, we had a big hit with one armed swordsman. So I'm going to have one armed boxer you know, or, or then I'm going to do a, a one armed swordsman with Zatoichi, a crossover with the popular uh, Japanese uh, Toho character Zatoichi. You know, and that resulted in a lawsuit. And uh, then when Shaw Brothers had a big hit with the flying guillotine, Jimmy Wong Yu said, well, you know what? I'm going to do a flying guillotine movie, a uh, one-armed boxer versus the flying guillotine. I'm going to rip off two Shaw Brothers movies and one. So, yeah, he just seemed to, you know. Like he looked to, for to, fights. Yeah. Yeah, he loved to fight. Yeah. <laughs> Off screen yeah, and on screen. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Both. Wow. These are really outsized characters. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> so, so can you elaborate more? You talked a lot about the Shaw Brothers, the film studio, and then um, you also talk in your book about the Golden Harvest. And can you talk about how actors were treated differently or similarly in those two um, studios and what influence that had on the works? Well, Golden Harvest came about because the, the two founders of the company had been at Shaw Brothers and were not happy and they left and then they took some some of the uh, on screen talent with them, like uh, Jimmy Wong Yu went to Golden Harvest uh, soon after leaving Shaw to do One Armed Boxer and, and some other films, Beach of the War Gods, which he got to direct. So uh, Golden Harvest uh I think was a lot, they, they were a lot more open to letting uh, someone like Wang Yu direct because he had he'd proven himself already at Shaw. And, uh, you know, okay, so you, you'll do this one movie for us, this like low budget thing called Tattoo Dragon, but then we will we'll let you direct a, a, a bigger film like Beach of the War Gods. And I, I th they were, they were just more, uh, more open with, uh, the type of projects they would uh, let the the actors and and the filmmakers do, uh, as opposed to Shaw, which I, I think it was uh, more more about control with the Shaw. Yes, yeah. Shaw loved control. Like that's that's really what they enjoyed, and they were a huge studio from the fifties, late fifties on through the. You know, they started getting in some trouble in the late 70s, early 80s, but then they just shut down Shaw Studio in 1986 and became a massive uh, TV channel, TVB, which is the biggest television channel in Hong Kong and, and still is to a large extent. So they, they, they weren't doing things wrong, but they really loved, they prioritized control. And because they did, they kept shooting themselves in the feet. Like Chris is saying, they lost Wong Yu because of their control issues. Then when Golden Harvest opened up, um, Bruce Lee came to Shaw Brothers first to cut a deal with them and they thought his asking price was ridiculous and he didn't show enough respect and so he just went over to Golden Harvest was just like yeah sure we'll put you in some movies and he became a huge star for them and then after that 
um, there were these guys, the Hui brothers, who were comedians, who got all their training from Shaw Brothers. They were on sh TV shows produced by Shaw Brothers. They were huge TV stars. And the Hui brothers, really, the three of them, one of whom was a giant pop star as well, they really wanted to be in movies. And Shaw would not let They're like, no, you guys do TV. That's what you do. And so Golden Harvest, like, We'll let you make movies. And they went over and made some of the biggest hits in Hong Kong history for Golden Harvest. And then as they were sort of getting even bigger at Golden Harvest, a guy named Jackie Chan, who was a Bruce Lee imitator and not very successful at it, was rambling around and he was finally getting some traction and he wanted to be in control of his movies. And he even went to Shaw at one point and they were like, you can be an actor, but we don't want you directing or doing the action choreography or anything. So he went to Golden Harvest. I mean, they just kept, you know, their need for control really scared away a lot of talent and Golden Harvest cleaned up. Sounds like it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, some chat I wanted to, that's drawing my oh, attention. Yeah. Um, um, Stephanie's asking, you know, who's considered the number one actor? And it uh, seems like Bruce Lee wins hands down, according to Derek. Um, but I was interested to know what you guys thought and who you might add to the list, if anyone. Um, you mean who, who are the our, our favorites, or who are the the most? Uh, well, like, Jackie I'm sorry, Chan. I, 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 un, I unmuted. Um, like who? Like, like you know, popular. Like who? If you were just polling people in the street, you know, who happen to be mm. really into kung fu movies, mm -hmm. like who would they think? Like I adore Bruce Lee and I would assume it was Bruce Lee. Jackie Chan never did it for me. So just check him. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say, well, Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, uh, that Chuck Norris, um, uh, and then you have Angela Mao. Um, and then, you know, we, we mentioned uh, Jimmy Wang Yu, Sonny Chiba. Um, uh, nowadays, yeah, North, Donnie Yen. Yeah, yeah Donnie Yen, definitely yeah. nowadays. Um, yeah, it's funny, you know, uh, Stephanie says, really, Chuck? But it's it's hard to under, it's hard to remember how huge Chuck Norris was. I mean, after Bruce Lee died in 73, everyone wanted to find the next Bruce Lee in America. And in Hong Kong and Asia, mostly, that question was solved with a lot of other people who weren't Bruce Lee, but especially by Jackie Chan. I mean, the late 70s kung fu comedies became huge overseas, but in the States, they never really took off. Um, Jackie Chan didn't really break in the States until the 90s, even though there was a huge push for him in the late 70s, early 80s, because he was so huge, like Chris said earlier, with Drunken Master and Snake and Eagle Shadow and these kung fu comedies that people like Sam Hung were making. And... Um, but we wanted tough guys. We wanted Bruce Lee's. We didn't want comedy in the States. Um, and, you know, there was a big push also to find a black martial artist who would be sort of the next Bruce Lee. And for a while, people thought maybe Jim Kelly, because he had that touch by an angel effect. He was in Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. And he had so much charisma, man. I mean, Jim Kelly could do so, could own a screen and do so little. Um but, but but also Jim Kelly really, he made some real dog movies that just did not click with audiences. They, and and he, they kind of got cheaper and cheaper. And um, he also was his own worst enemy. He gave terrible interviews. Jim Kelly was really uh, argumentative in interviews and he really promoted himself and talked trash about a lot of really popular athletes like Muhammad Ali and George Foreman and other actors. And so he, people just really got tired of him quickly. Um, after him, a guy named Ron Van Cleef, people thought might be this big black breakthrough martial arts star. Um, but he never, as big as he got in independent movies, he was in a movie called The Black Dragon. that was a big hit. Um, a couple of others, but he never clicked with Hollywood. He was always in independent movies and movies that were kind of coming from independent producers outside the Hollywood system. And so Ron never quite made it over there. And then in the late seventies, Chuck Norris appeared and he really was like, he nailed it. Um, you know, and no one believed in Chuck Norris. I mean, uh, he, I'm not a huge Chuck fan, but I got to respect the guy. Like, 
his first movie was this trucker movie, Breaker, Breaker. And then after that, people all sort of treated him like Run Run Shaw treated Jimmy Wong Yu as sort of, that's nice. You're a karate guy. Go, you're an athlete. You teach in your dojos. You were in a movie with Bruce Lee. We understand. Go, go. No one wants to see your movie. And, you know, he was in Good Guys Wear Black. He was in, you know, he kept making movies and no one would release them. And so he hooked up with this company that was a tax shelter company. And what they would do is rent movie theaters because no one would show these Chuck Norris movies. They would rent the theater. So they would go out to theaters wherever, all across America and pay the owners a flat fee to rent a screen for a week. And then they would show the Chuck Norris movie and keep the box office. And they worked Chuck like a rented mule, man. He would be on the road six, eight, nine, ten 10 months out of the year promoting these movies, doing karate demos, introducing screenings. And the movies were making 18, 19, 20 million bucks, which was a lot of money. And he did that. And then he did another movie and everyone said, no one wants to see your movies, Chuck. That was a fluke. So he did the whole thing again. And then everyone said that was a fluke. So he did it again. And everyone said he did four movies that were basically self-released where he lived on the road promoting them before he started getting studio deals and, and contracts and things like that. Um, so you have to respect the guy's work ethic. And he really did in the late 70s, early 80s, sort of, he became the face of martial arts movies. He did the first big ninja movie, The Octagon in America. And he was kind of the martial arts guy. And in the mid eighties, he, you know, ninjas appeared and Chuck Norris started doing more movies with guns like Invasion USA and Delta Force and things like that. But he really was the face of martial arts movies for a long time in the States. Sounds like he worked really hard for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. And he was a dork. I mean, you know, the first time he tried to break a board, he broke his hand. He gives in, you watch his old interviews and it's like, it's like watching a golden retriever. Like he's adorable and he's dorky and he says really dumb stuff. Like acting's hard because you have to say words that you've memorized, like as if you're saying them for the first time. And he's so sincere. It's just, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Derek just said his dad scouted sites for film with Chuck Norris and such. Yeah. And, you know, he comes across as the nicest guy. I've never seen anyone who had anything bad to say about Chuck Norris. He seems like the nicest guy. And he comes across in interviews as this really sweet guy. Um, but, yeah, he's, 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 he's Chuck. <laughs> That's a great story. So, um, while we've talked a lot about actors, um, and you mentioned ninjas becoming a craze mm -hmm. in the 80s it sounds like chuck norris was a big piece of that yeah do you have any any sort to, of help sort of anything to but, add about ninjas well the book chris i don't know if you want to talk about well um the n ninjas really in the u.s uh it, it, they uh they, they first entered the <laughs> entered the u.s uh through james bond through you only live twice the novel as well as the the movie in 1967 and uh at, right after that you started to see uh ninjas in comic books and then uh episodic tv like there's a, a ninja in an episode of hawaii 5 and uh the killer elite but really uh it wasn't until the the best-selling novel by uh, eric van Lusbader, uh the ninja 1980 and so 1980 is really the, that's the year when Ninja broke into the U.S. really as a, as a sort of a, a subgenre, let's say, of, of the martial arts movie. Because you had the, the Chuck Norris movie, The Octagon that we just mentioned, uh, the, the novel, The Ninja, and then uh, Shogun, the, uh, the big miniseries based on the James Clavell novel, uh, which was, I think, think had the second highest ratings of uh of any miniseries I think uh only roots yeah uh, yeah had had uh more viewers than than shogun and i i forgot what night it was when the the ninja <laughs> show up but uh but it was a week-long miniseries and uh that that was the first that a, a lot of people in the u.s saw ninjas on uh, on network television um and 
and yeah, and it just took off from there. I mean, there, uh, the producers of Jaws, uh, Zanuck Brown, bought the film rights to the uh, to the novel The Ninja, and they just never got their act together to do the movie. But you know, while they were trying to to get it done, everybody else was cranking out their own low budget ninja movies and. Yeah, there were, there was never any need for uh, an adaptation because everybody did it first. And and I do want to say two quick things out of that. One of them is that you know the first person actually teach the martial art of ninjutsu in America was a black man named Ron Duncan, uh, who was teaching ninjutsu after hours out of his dojo in Brooklyn in the early '60s. And Duncan was not like, he was not a nobody. He was on ABC Wild World of Sports, mm -hmm. catching arrows and doing ninja stuff, um, even in the 60s and into the early 70s. Um, but he got, no, there was a huge East Coast, West Coast feud in the martial arts world. Um, and um, where basically all the magazines were on the West Coast. And, um, they felt like like and and so there was a real thing where there was a feeling that the east coast were a lot of the the black and latino uh martial artists and they you know they were scrappier they had their dojos in cities and in rough neighborhoods they weren't as photogenic and um but the magazine and on the west coast it was like you know it was a lot more white owned dojos and a lot of like these uh, sort of slicker style and a lot more sort of like showbiz ready uh characters so there was always a conflict between the two and Ron Duncan got in a beef with the editor of Black Belt Magazine and they never covered him. And in fact, put a white guy on the cover of their magazine shortly after they had an argument at some show and saying, this is the founder, the first American ninja and, and promoted this guy who sold books through Black Belt Magazine's publishing company as the first man to teach ninjutsu in America. And Ron Duncan really got erased from history. And it's only in the past decade or so, maybe past 20 years, that people have been putting his name out there and really giving him the respect he deserves. Um, but the other thing to say, Chris is, Chris is underplaying the ninja thing a little bit because one of the most fun things in this book was the ninja crime wave that yeah. broke out in, <laughs> in the 80s. Um, and it started when two kids dressed as ninjas broke into Penny Marshall's house of Laverne and Shirley fame and held her hostage with a, uh, a ninja sword <laughs> for hours um, in, a, in a really botched robbery kind of thing. And they wound mm -hmm. up going to juvie. But after that, man, it was like people dressed as ninjas, killing people, <laughs> robbing, robbing nightclubs, breaking into their girlfriend's house, living in the attic of their girlfriend's house before sneaking down. Like, I mean, it was crazy ninja crimes everywhere. Yeah, there, there's a in the book, there's a two page spread of like newspaper you know, headlines and 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 the caption uh is just Grady wrote the caption for the <laughs> for, for this ninja crime wave. There's nothing funny at all in in this caption. Like what happened? You know, the, these crimes, they're, they're not funny, but they're bad crimes. Just, but just reading it, it becomes hilarious. Like I, I cannot get through this thing without cracking up just because of the momentum it builds. <laughs> it's just so ridiculous. It yeah, is. That, I mean, ninja, yeah. yeah. I mean, and you know, it's funny. There was, I mean, for the ninja costume was this Halloween costume. It was like thirty six ninety five. It became so popular, it sold out everywhere. But it also became like, I don't know if you'd say like, well, I'd say like the AR fifteen of crime. It was just like <laughs> everyone had one if they were committing a crime. So you're just reading about everything from vandalism sprees in New Jersey to dudes going into their girlfriend's house and killing everyone inside of it in like Orange County, it's all being committed by ninjas. It is the most hallucinatory headlines to read in a row. Or the teenager who climbed up on the power line and- Yeah, yeah and like knocked out the power to a big chunk of suburban New Jersey and also died. Yeah, uh, like 34,000 volts shooting yeah. through him and, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah so i mean and the ninja thing was huge and there was ninja movies came coming out the wazoo 
for a long time and people making their homemade ninja movies. There was a, what was it, Chris? Justice Ninja Style out of Missouri. Yep. Mm-hmm. And what was the one that Alamo, the Alamo guys just re-released? Um, oh, oh, there were those tra- kids in Chicago or whatever. Uh, Trail of the Ninja. I think Trail the of the Ninja. Or? Treasure yeah. of the Ninja. Right. Yeah. Well, there, yeah, there are like I, two or three different movies on that Blu-ray. But yeah, yeah. it was Treasure of the Ninja. Yeah. Um, and I was just going to say, Derek was just saying, uh, mm-hmm. growing up in San Man, growing up in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s, I mean, there were so many movie theaters on the chi- what was known as the Chinatown circuit. San Francisco was huge. Uh, L.A. had a lot. Uh, Missouri had some. I mean, um, uh, New York, uh, everywhere. I mean, all across Canada were these movies that were owned, Chinese-owned theaters showing Hong Kong movies mostly to mostly Chinese American audiences, but also big, uh, large black audiences, um, you know, who were connected to the martial arts before they broke big in 73. And uh, so I would have loved to go on to some of those theaters, Derek, but you also said that for years, I thought only Chinese folks appreciated these films, how the light I was find out all races enjoy these films. And, you know, and that's one of the things is these movies had such an influence on the development of hip hop, on street culture, on b-boy culture on even graffiti uh art and and in turn you know the movies were influenced by hollywood and they came back and influenced hollywood and street culture and so there's this real cycle of these movies just like being a part of this last gasp of sort of grassroots culture coming up from the streets in new york and la and chicago and boston in the in the 70s it was this amazing moment can you elaborate on that, Grady, with some examples? Um, I found that really fascinating. I don't know a lot about it. And, um, you know, just the influence on hip hop and um, sure. et cetera. Just, you know, I, I think that's yeah. really interesting cross fertilization. I mean, you know, one of the one of the big things was these movies were really 1973 was the year that these movies went big in America. And um Uh, Kung Fu movies. And one of the things distributors started realizing is that these movies were really embraced by a a non-white audience, a black and Latin audience. Um, More so the white audience was there, but they kind of dwindled after 73. And um, they realized that there's what they would call their urban theaters were doing great business with this stuff. Everyone knew it. I mean, there were a lot of theaters that were running uh, a pure diet of black exploitation movies and Kung Fu movies. And that was what they showed for years. And it made a lot of sense. These were movies starring non-white actors uh, in starring roles. Um, They were movies often about um, where the storyline was about kids who had nothing. You know, they were poor, they were blue collar, and they were being kept down by a corrupt power structure, corrupt politicians, corrupt gangsters, whatever it is within the Kung Fu, you know, movie context. And they fought back with what they had, which is their bare hands. and so there was this real element of kind of fighting the power and sort of like mm-hmm. kicking up, right? You're, you have nothing, but you're fighting people who have everything. And it was non-white actors. And those were really, these movies became really embraced by non-white audiences. And you started to see the crossover. Um, one of the early flyers for the Rocksteady crew doing one of their early demonstrations, it says, you know, we are doing b-boying, which is a mixture of... Um, I think they say dance, hip hop, and or dance, rapping, and martial arts. Um, and you had crews challenging each other. You had them doing dance offs with each other, which were to some extent influenced by what they were seeing in martial arts movies. Um, a Crazy Legs Colon, a Rocksteady member, he was so influenced by Kung Fu movies that when B-Boying in the mid 70s kind of died out, he started searching out all the big b-boys he was hearing about you know this guy practices this style and he's really good at you know floor work and he's out on you know near long island or near staten island he'd go there and he'd like compete with this guy and sort of learn his skills and see what he's doing then he'd go take on the next one it's very much like a kung fu movie he was like living a kung fu movie um you had kids in gangs and kids just who were hanging out and having a good time wearing Kung Fu influenced like stuff, you know, the straw hats. Um, They were putting dragons on the back of their their jackets. They were carrying nunchucks. They were making themselves. Uh, There was a huge moral panic about nunchucks uh, based on a Newsweek article or a Newsday article. Sorry, I think it was Newsday. Um, 
where all these legislatures started banning them because they were they were they were kill, killing sticks um, when mostly what people did with nunchucks was hit themselves in the head. Um, but you know, like lots of kids like carrying them because they were easy to make and they looked badass. And Bruce Lee used them, and like cops just freaked out. Um, so yeah, and you know, and Chris was talking about Sonny Chiba and the Street Fighter movies. There was even a moment where, like, like uh, I think they were I, they were like an off-brand tennis shoe, but they were the Street Fighter tennis shoe that was out there. So, yeah. you know, in that poster of Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon, that was on every kid's bedroom wall. Um, so you know, these movies really like spoke to they were they were movies made by not white people that spoke to everyone, but they especially spoke to non-white Americans who really were ready to see themselves and and people who looked like them on screen doing something besides playing a drug dealer or a pimp or being Sidney Poitier. You know, it was like a saint or a sinner. And these movies gave a lot of gradation and a lot of roles in between. And they were movies with not a single white person in them, which I'm sure was freaking refreshing. Yeah, yeah. And you'd you'd see like um, like on Soul Train, uh, Jody Watley oh, yeah. would would you know see a kung fu movie and then the next day show up on Soul Train and work the moves into her dance. Yeah, uh, and you you would see like like uh, st- something like Snake and Eagle Shadow or some of the Joseph Quo movies like Seven Grand Masters. Well, I'd be right there, Seven Grand Masters that was you know grandmaster flash some of the you know the, uh taking his name from uh grandmaster from yeah you know not not chess it's martial arts um but uh you know the the actual break dancing i mean so a lot of the moves that you see or that you saw in the early 80s break dancing moves came right out of joseph quo movies or jackie chan movies i mean snake and eagle shadow when he's doing the uh the steps where he's memorizing the steps that uh, Simon Yoon th- threw down for him. Yeah, I mean a l- lot of that he's spinning around. He's you know we're using his hands and his feet, and uh, and then uh, a lot of the leg fighters, uh, so- some of the moves that they would do, where they would get down um, on the ground, especially and and fight just with their legs. I mean, that all of that went into uh, break dancing moves. And then you saw that sort of get echoed and re-echoed back when movies like Wild Style about breakdancing mm-hmm. and b-boy culture started playing overseas and you started seeing Hong Kong movies and Hong Kong dancers and Hong Kong mm-hmm. street culture learning from that to incorporate breakdancing back into the movies in the early yeah. 80s. So, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's it all goes around. Yeah. And, you know, um, we earlier we were talking about the judo when the uh, the judo practitioners came and <clears> fought fought people in the u.s uh a lot of those a lot of those fighters went back to japan and helped make professional wrestling so popular i mean that because yeah. you know because of the uh catch wrestling was a big thing here for a while and yeah yeah well, and also, I just want to say really quickly, uh, Raymond said, what about Van Damme and Steven Seagal within this movie culture? So they came a little later, uh, actually, and especially Seagal. Um, sort of after, we sort of, uh, Derek mentions The Last Dragon, Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon with Ty Mac and Vanity. And that's sort of where we saw this, this first wave of these movies start coming to an end, which is where we started uh, ra- wrapping up the book. Uh, and The Last Dragon is a really fun movie. Um, but I was going to say, but interestingly, Jean-Claude Van Damme um, is a Hong Kong discovery. He was over in Hong Kong back when, God, Chris, do you remember what his name was before he changed it? Um, I cannot. No, no. Yeah, yeah, I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. But he was knocking on doors being like, I am a kickboxer. Put me in a movie. And there was a company called IFD that was like, well, they, they were a real fly. They, they were a real like grind house. They turned out like dozens of movies. They were like, we'll make a movie with you, but we've got seven movies we have to make first. <laughs> and then by the time they got to him, he'd come back to the States. But um, these Hong Kong producers, they really wanted, one of them saw um, the Karate Kid in the US while he was visiting his sister in Canada. And he called up the producer of Jackie Chan's Drunken Master, who he knew, and was like, they are ripping off our movies just with worse martial arts. Um, and so they decided to make an American martial arts movie 
with Hong Kong talent. And so they came over and actually had auditions in the States and found so much talent, one of whom was Jean-Claude Van Damme, who came to these auditions and was in his first big role in No Retreat, No Surrender, which is a Hong Kong version of the Karate Kid, um, except with, you know, actual like, you know, uh, with, with more of a Hong Kong feeling to it and with Bruce Lee, the ghost of Bruce Lee in it. Um, so yeah, so, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme, like yeah, Hong Kong started him. Uh, and then he really broke out a few years later with, uh, oh God, what was it, Chris? Kickboxer? Uh, Bloodsport. Bloodsport, Jesus, yeah. thank you. Yep. Yeah, we... To get to- Oh, we, pretty, ahead, we, uh, we pretty much uh, wanted to stop the book in 1988. And, um, you know, we had a, a number of reasons why, but one of them was that was really the first year when Van Damme and also Steven Seagal broke out, you know, because Seagal's uh, first movie was Above the Law was that year yeah. and, and Van Damme's big breakout. So, uh, you know, there were other reasons why, but that just went into a different, a whole other direction. And rather than deal with that, Uh, it was one of the reasons why we stopped at 1988. Well, so before I get into Mm -hmm. what your future books will be (laughs) post-1988, Stephanie asks how you got Riza to do the intro. Um, Well, uh, Mondo, who published the book, is uh, in part owned by the Alamo Drafthouse guys, and they have a long working relationship with Riza. And Riza you know, Rizza loves this stuff. He grew up watching these movies in Times Square. And I got to say, the guy is, he's a genuine fan of the movies. And he was like, yeah, you think that'll help the book? Great, I'll do it. Nice. Um, and, and he's busy. So he came in like at the 11th hour, but, but he said he'd do it and he did it. And he's been a huge supporter of the book ever since. And, and there's some stuff we have planned with him coming up. But, um, and he's, he just genuinely loves these movies and sort of the part of his life and culture and childhood they represent. And um, he'll do anything to help get the word out about them. So I have to say, I loved a, a lot of the source material that's in the books, the posters, the clippings. I thought that that just added such rich texture to the book. So um, if you haven't seen it, um, and we just have a couple copies at the library. I'm going to bring mine back tomorrow so people can check it out. But I, I really appreciate your, I think it's mostly Chris, your collections and how they're represented in the book. And they really offer a lot of, I just think, authenticity and rich texture, um, which I appreciate. It means we don't have to go research at all. So thank you. <laughs> um, so um, I did want to just sort of you, so you, you, you chose a specific ending point. Um, so are you going to continue? What's next for you guys? Um, seems like there's a lot more material maybe. What do you think? Uh, well, we could, we, we could definitely, uh, we could, we could do a revised uh, version of the book for sure. I mean, we, we could, uh, maybe there, there's no end, I think, to the, the graphics. <laughs> I mean, we could, probably swap out some posters here and there and uh and add i mean we we cut a lot of material out and um and and there were there were some things that that were in the book that uh uh like little things that uh that that we could elaborate on um just because of you know space and and, you know other what the book would be twice as long if we didn't if we didn't cut out some of these things yeah yeah Um, and you know, and what, one of the things we have talked about a little bit, I don't know if we're serious about this or not. Um, but a lot of these movies were released in the U S by independent producers, uh, who mostly operated out of New York, uh, and times square in general, where they had their offices. And these guys are fascinating. I mean, they are carny hucksters in the best sense of the word. And you know, they are really amazing people. Like one of them, Sarah from Carol Alexis, who produced the Black Dragon movies and actually brought the second martial arts movie to America. Um, He tried a case in front of the Supreme Court because he did porn movies before this. And he wound up, you know, taking an obscenity case to the Supreme Court and had this really, and wound up producing a movie with Martin Scorsese years later. I mean, these guys had these really amazing lives. And we've we've talked about doing something about them, but the amount of research, I don't know, man, this this book was rough. 
Um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if we're willing to stick our faces in the fan so quickly again. <laughs> but the one thing we do think will happen most likely is um, there's been a lot of talk about doing a, a documentary TV series based on the book. And that, oh. fingers crossed, will happen. And that'll let us expand into a lot of areas where um, we weren't able to go in the book. It seems like a great, a great way to go because just the, it's just such a it's just all visual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I just wrote that. I'm sorry, I jumped in. I said you guys need a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. So, any more questions or comments? We're a little over an hour, and I just don't want anyone to miss the opportunity to to jump in and have your say before we call it a night. Oh yeah, if, if uh, yeah, if anybody has a question, you want to turn on the mic and uh, definitely jump in. Yeah, because I see there, are, there are a lot of. Uh... I'm oh, sorry, I just, oh, here we go. I just, I'm just so into this. Um, <laughs> when you were talking about um, uh, the black black characters and influence and culture and stuff, I was I immediately started thinking of like the Boondocks, the TV mm. show Boondocks. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Because he's totally into uh martial arts and um and what was he uh, oh black dynamite oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's interesting michael jai white who did black dynamite is a really fascinating guy it's he's you know he's he's a beast if you ever see him in person he is huge and he's an amazing martial artist. He's a really good actor. He's really smart. He's really funny. And he has a career doing, you know, a lot of these more action-oriented movies, like um, like the, the Blood and Bone movies and Undisputed and things like mm-hmm. that. And then he has the career doing, you know, more mainstream movies where he's doing drama or comedy or he's done some Tyler Perry movies and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny. One of the interesting things is, a lot of times some genre of film will get will get stuck with a label, right? Um, and, and because so many Kung Fu movies were getting released in America in the 70s, um, and, and a lot of bad ones were getting released, distributors are just grabbing anything with martial arts in it. Mm-hmm. Um, there still is a little prejudice towards them uh, in the sense of, oh, you know, martial arts movies, eh, they're fun, but they're not real movies. And I was actually talking to a producer about Michael Jai White, and he was like, you know, the guy's so talented. He's so great. He's so sorry. He can do everything, but sort of a liability because, I mean, you just, you know, you put him in your movie and people think you're doing some cheap martial arts thing that's going to go straight to cable. And I was like, wow, it is oh, amazing yeah. to me that, you know, from 1976 to now, this sort of label of like, you know, when that was sort of the, the heyday of really bad Kung Fu movies coming out. Uh, in the late 70s, um, that that's stuck with it to now. You know, it's it's incredible. You guys, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, Derek here, thank you so much hey. for doing this. Uh, you know, no, and also thanks memories. for sharing the story about your dad's Lincoln Continental, dude. That's amazing. Uh, it's, yeah, I've, got, I've got so many stories, I can't tell you. But, but I, I was curious what you guys thought about, you know, the fact that... Um, Hong Kong is not making movies anymore. Shaw Brothers is long gone and Golden Harvest is long gone. More content's coming out of China itself. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm wondering where, where you think the direction of uh, martial arts movies uh, is, is going? Will, will they continue to be popular or are we just going to see them blended into American-made fare? I mean, mm. you know, My quick take on that is what's really fascinating about Hong Kong is Hong Kong shouldn't have been the movie making powerhouse. It was. It is a city of what, nine million people, roughly, um, that was making 200 to 300 movies a year for decades. And they were amazing movies that had this huge influence. And you think, oh, my God, how did this like how did this happen? Um, And so it makes me sad that Hong Kong's not what it used to be. And it's not what it used to be as a film producer. It's not what it used to be in a lot of ways, um, which really bums me out as someone who loves Hong Kong from the bottom of their heart. Um, But you see that influence has spread so far overseas. You look at um, Thailand, where you had people like Pana Ritakrai and and Tony Jaa, 
who were watching Hong Kong movies on VHS and teaching themselves how to do stunts and then making movies like Ong Bak and The Protector and uh, Born to Fight and these, these Thai amazing action movies. And then you saw that influence travel to um, uh, Indonesia with, with uh, <coughs> Yukoi Weiss uh, and the movies like The Raid and all that, which definitely they talk about what a huge impact seeing Hong Kong movies and learning how to shoot action the way people in Hong Kong did. And in The Raid 2, they're using Hong Kong stunt choreographers like Bruce Law to do their car chases and things. Um, and you see it spread out and out and out. And, you know, you look at French kids doing parkour when that was first becoming this huge trend. And so many of them talked about how they were getting moves from watching Jackie Chan. Um, and even today, you know, there's guys in um, Pakistan who are making action movies where they're like, oh, we make these movies because we grew up seeing John Woo movies. Um, and you have people like there's a guy who calls himself Bruce Yu in Uganda, where there's this really rough and ready film industry that calls itself Wakaliwood, because Wakalia is a slum of Kilgasa, where everyone looks down on, they're like, nothing good one comes from Wakalia. And everyone's like, our movies do, and they're enormously popular in, that in Uganda and the surrounding areas. And this guy, Bruce Yu, basically was a poor kid, um, and he would go to the town dump because during one of the, uh, during the revolution in Uganda, when someone would be sort of like targeted and, and, and sent to jail, all their possessions would be taken and thrown in the town garbage dump. And he would always go in there looking for martial arts magazines and Hong Kong videotapes. And he taught himself his own kind of like martial art, watching old Hong Kong videotapes. And he now styles himself as the Bruce Lee of Uganda. And he's made a whole series of martial arts movies in Uganda shot on video that are really, really popular. So Hong Kong, it's not what it was, but Hong Kong never dies. That influence is out there and it's all over the world. Uh, Bao Tran, you know, out of Seattle, just made Paper Tigers, which, and he is sort of a family friend of Corey Yun Kwai, the Hong Kong director and martial arts choreographer who grew up training with Jackie Chan and Sam Oh Hung. And, you know, he's doing more movies. So these, these movies, they keep on Michelle Yeoh right now and everything everywhere all at once. There's so many shout outs to Hong Kong cinema in that movie. It's just, you know, Hong Kong RIP, but Hong Kong never dies. You answered my question. Thank you so much. So these movies won't just be coming out of China. They're coming from all over the world. And, and you I think, of, yeah, and I think that yeah. you look at the way China does a martial arts movie, and it's not a Hong Kong movie. And mm -hmm. I think you can say that, you know, Bruce Yu's movies are as much Hong Kong movies as Chinese versions of a martial arts movie are a Hong Kong movie. They're both taking the DNA and, and splicing it into something new. Wonderful. Thank you so much. No, thanks for, for being here tonight. I just wanted to <laughs> give a another just call for questions before we late for you guys before we call it a night. Any other comments? Okay. Well, I'm going to say thank you both so much for your knowledge and enthusiasm. You're, you're um, welcome. Goes way beyond yeah, the co you. covers of the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks for coming out. And definitely. Yeah. Um, thesefistbreakbricks.com. We have a ton of info up about the book, a bunch of extra stuff that didn't make it into the book we post there from time to time. So, uh, and you can find where to buy it there. Great, great. And you can find it at the Marin County Free Library as well as bookstores and on your website. So um, I just want to say thank you and you're getting thanks from other folks as well. Um, and there was a, there is a Bruce Lee exhibit that was mentioned mm. earlier that I just wanted to make sure we all saw. Um, it's a, a Bruce Lee exhibit at the Chinese Historical Society mm. in San Francisco. So, um, you know, I, for those of us who want to kind of continue uh, exploring. Yes, thank you, Shereen. Celebrating. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you for making the connection. Um, <laughs> it was a pleasure to learn more about this time in our history. It's really culturally rich in ways that you all knew about, but I certainly did not. So um, I really appreciate gaining a, a broad appreciation. So thank you. So thank you. Um, it's lovely to meet you all. Have a great night.
And you too. Um, I'm going to say good night and call it a day. Good night. All right. Good, good night, y'all. Thanks good for night. coming out. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Grady.